What is rotten eggs, rotten fruit, and spoiled milk? What is rotten eggs, rotten fruit, and spoiled milk? Groceries. <laughs> All right. What is the baby corn? Ask the mama corn. What is the baby corn? Ask the mama corn. Where's popcorn? Good job. Nice job. Popcorn, apparently. All right. How many of you have a tattoo? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you thinking about getting one? Lower it up. All right. So let's take a look at this. The question here is: they're permanent ink markings, and they're injected into the skin. So where do you think they get injected? Talk to your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor. And you guys talk to your neighbor loud. Man. I'm glad you don't live near me. <laughs> We've got an answer right now. I can defend it. Listen up. Listen up. The dermis, because... six to eight weeks. So if you open, opened a tattoo parlor, you might think about that, you'd have repeat customers, but they'd be really upset with you, okay? So it is the, um, it is the uh, dermis that we inject ink into for these tattoos, and you can see the profile on the far right. <clears throat> the needle goes through the epidermal layer, it goes into the dermal layer, and that's where you inject the ink, okay? Now what happens if you, you made a mistake, okay? You had a moment of not such great wisdom, okay? It's known to happen in college, I think. Uh, well, you can get them removed, and so I'm going to show you, we use laser to do this. We use laser because the laser actually sends energy to the ink and it vaporizes the ink in location, okay? So let's take a look at what this looks like. Just had a friend that had one removed. She said it wasn't terrible. 
Um, but she said it was, it was like um, getting snapped with a, with a wet towel or like a rubber band. She said, so I think actually the removal was worse than the actual tattoo. Yeah. Do, do you know how the body doesn't recognize the ink as like a foreign material? And oh, it does. It? Oh, it absolutely recognizes it foreign. Okay. So if you took histology through um, a tattoo, and if you have that digital histology DVD, there's actually a tattoo in the skin on that, on that DVD. And you can actually identify capsulation around the ink. And you can see foreign body giant cells. So the body tries to get rid of it. That's why over time they'll fade. So, I mean, if you have a tattoo when you're 70, it's not going to look nearly as good as it did when you were 20. Okay? For all sorts of reasons. But, um, <laughs> but the ink fades. The, the sunlight... Uh, fades the ink as well, but then the body itself tries to get rid of it and phagocytose the ink. Okay, so you can get them touched up, you know, brighten them up if they're starting to fade. Um, just don't get them over areas that are super saggy when you get old, you'll be fine. <laughs> so, let, oh yeah, another question? Yeah. Is that the same process as laser No, it's a different process. Um, the laser hair removal uses a different type of laser. It doesn't need to vaporize the hair. It just needs to send enough energy to kill the root where the hair grows at. Okay? So, you know, the, the strategy is different. Here you actually need to send enough energy so that you heat up the ink and it vaporizes it in place. And then as it fades over time, it's because the body comes in and the ink is in smaller particles that the macrophages can actually gobble it up. Okay. So next up on sort of this last little segment on skin before we move into the skeletal system, uh, I want to talk about types of burns. There are three main types of burns that you hear about. First degree, second degree, and third degree. First degree burns only affect the epidermis. They tend to be very red and painful, and you see a lot of tissue edema, which is fluid in the tissue. But you don't actually have the dermis, the deep layer of the dermis is, uh, being affected in a first degree burn. In a second degree burn, so there's a lot of white space over here. The whole idea is that you write some of these pieces of information down there. Yes? What was the fluid called? What was what? The fluid called again? Edema. E-D-E-M-A. It's not a name of a fluid. It's just a name that refers to a pooling of fluid in a tissue. Edema. Okay. A second degree burn involves the epidermis as well as parts of the dermis, and you get blistering. So how many of you have been sunburned? Okay. How many of you have been sunburned to the point where it blistered? Okay. That would be a second degree burn. Okay. It's very easy to discriminate between a first degree, which would just be red. It can be painful, but you don't get any blistering. What about peeling? Well, it might peel later, but if there was no blistering, then it probably never made it to the dermis. A third degree burn is obviously most aggressive. The epidermis and the dermis, much of the dermis is destroyed. It often requires grafts, skin grafts. Um, disfigurement can take place. So this would be very unlikely to happen uh, with a sunburn. More likely to happen with a fire uh, or a chemical burn would be a third degree burn. The two main things that we worry about with burns, especially third degree burns, First and foremost is we worry about water loss. Because the skin, as that barrier, prevents moisture from leaving. And so when the skin is compromised, let's say a patient has burns of 75, 80% of their body, they're losing a lot of water uh, because it's not maintaining a barrier. So that's the first thing you worry about. The second thing you worry about is what? What do you think? Infection. So once you've created a barrier, now you're worrying about infection where... Uh, the first step is you don't want to lose valuable stuff. The second step is you don't want bad stuff to come in. Yes? When you get second degree burns and your skin sloughs off, is that just your entire epidermal layer coming off? Or is it well, it would be the epidermal layer for sure. And, and if you had a second degree burn, the portion of the dermis that was damaged is also sloughed off too. Yeah. All right. When we treat these wounds... We usually um, will, if the body doesn't slough it off, then you actually have to physically remove that dead tissue. 
and you need to remove it because it's necrotic. And that's whether it's a chemical burr or whether it's frostbite or whether it's a major laceration that actually has become infected and now there's necrotic tissue there. Uh, how do you know if there's necrotic tissue? A lot of times there's pus. And that pus is cellular debris that is being collected as a result of the macrophages and the leukocytes trying to clean up the tissue. So what you do is you have to actually clean that thing out. And we, there's a special term, it's called debriding the wound or debridement of the wound. D-E-B-R-I-D-E-M-E-N-T. So debriding or debridement of the wound is where you remove the necrotic tissue. How do you do that? Well, you can do it mechanically, where you wash it aggressively with <coughs> detergents. Okay? Uh, you may actually scrape out with a scalpel uh, the necrotic tissue, or you may cut away the dead tissue with a scalpel. All of this is called debriding or debriding the wound. Um, in older uh, medicine and other cultures, you've, you've heard about maggot therapy being used, where you'd have a, a, a pretty infected and pussing wound, and they would stuff maggots in the wound. Why do they do that? Other than it looks really cool in a movie if you're watching it. Why would they do that? Why does that work? They eat dead flesh, and they only eat necrotic tissue, and they won't touch living tissue. So it's actually, it works quite well. I'm not sure it's adopted up at FMC, uh, but you could ask for it the next time you went in. Okay? So a sunburn. Let's, um, let's take a look at this. If you go outside in bright sunshine like this, chances are that you're going to get a... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Hang on, hang on. Oh, bummer. I don't know what happened. The last video played just fine. Let's try it. If you go outside in bright sunshine like this, chances are that you're going to get a... No. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened. My file must have got corrupted. Uh, this file is actually loaded on BB Learn, though. Okay, the resource folder. Uh, so, with a sunburn, what happens is that ultraviolet light, okay, it causes damage to the tissue. And as it causes damage to the tissue, you get an inflammatory event taking place in order to try to repair the tissue. That inflammatory event, first and foremost, is going to increase blood flow to the area. That's why when you have a sunburn, it gets red, because you increase blood flow to the area. That's also why when you have a sunburn, it gets swollen, because you've increased blood flow, and now more fluid leaks out. That's that word edema that we talked about. So you get swelling and fluid in the area because of the damaged cells due to the radiation from the sun. Eventually, right, the repair process takes place, and the blood flow subsides or goes back to normal, and the tissue loses its redness. It returns to a regular hydration level, okay, and you've actually gone through this repair process. So, you can look up this on BB Learn and you can see the file itself. I have to figure out why it actually got corrupted. Sorry about that. But the skin and the repair mechanisms is what I want to talk about. Whether it's a sunburn or whether it's a major wound, there's two main repair processes that take place. The first repair process is known as regeneration. Now, regeneration is synonymous with a term known as resolution. So regeneration and resolution are really synonymous terms. They, they two, are two words for the same thing. And this is the replacement of damaged tissue with the same tissue type, returning it to its regular function. So the key word with regeneration is you restore function of the original tissue. Now think about a big scar that you have like on your knee, on your elbow, okay, maybe on your forehead or the back of your head. Okay, depending upon how active of a kid are, you were, you're going to have scars in various locations. Okay? So if there was a scar, that's actually fibrosis or scarring. That is not regeneration because the tissue that replaced your damaged tissue 
doesn't have the exact same function as the original <coughs> tissue. So for example, if you cut your scalp and you can still see that line and no hair grew back, then those hair follicles that were in the integument, right, they never grew back. So the function of the skin has been compromised. Now the other thing is, if, if you have darker complected skin and you had a big scar, it may come back with a slightly different pigment or coloration. So the melanocytes aren't doing exactly what they were doing before. Again, that's an example of fibrosis, not regeneration. So with fibrosis, the body tries to fill in the gap with patchwork. It would love to be able to do it originally like it was first designed, but we can't necessarily do that as adults anymore. We lose that ability outside of of the uterus, outside of being born, where embryonic development happens, there's an, a, ve a very aggressive and a very clean wound healing response, and you get a lot of regeneration. You've heard facts and stories about spina bifida cases of, of babies, and they'll go in surgically in utero and do surgery, and the baby is born with legitimately no scar on their spine, okay? Because the wound healing process in utero is much more preserved and much more intact than it is as adults. Question. Our DNA from cells in the area have the framework to make the correct cell. Why do we ever resort to fibrosis? Well, <clears throat> because as the cells get older, they wear out. They lose their ability to divide. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, you need a stem cell source in order to replace large amounts of tissue. You can't just use the exact same cells in the region. And our source of stem cells as adults is limited compared to what it was embryonic. Okay. So two main differences. Regeneration or resolution and then fibrosis or where you would see scarring. Well, when we talk about these graphs, we have large wounds or large burns over a major part of the body. We will resort to graphs and a lot of times we'll take a graph from another location in the patient. We call that an autologous graft. Autologous. A-U-T-O, auto meaning self. Okay? A self graft. <clears throat> so you might take it from the back of the thigh. You might take it from the buttocks or the lower back. You may take it from, um, the, scal uh, uh, from the scapula region. And you're going to put it through a device that actually meshes out it's like a meat press. It takes a small surface area and it rolls it out like a rolling pin so that it covers a larger area. In, in the process of doing that, it puts in these little hexagonal shapes. And so you can see on this patient on the right that the skin graft worked very well, but there is a little bit of residual fibrosis that, that is left over. And depending upon the age of the patient when it happened, depending upon the extent of the, uh, of the covering that needs to be made, uh, you may see less aggressive scarring, or you might see more aggressive scarring. What's the word again? Autologous. 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 A U T O L O G O U S. Autologous. The area that they take the skin graft from, Yeah, usually they'll just kind of sew it back together. So they can take a small little segment and they can actually approximate it, close it up, and then they can use that skin graft in another location. They might do multiple sites, you know, because the, the site that you harvest then is a, is a secondary traumatic site. So you don't want to make that site too big. So what's going to burn or cause a scar? Would that be like a second degree or a third degree? Just because it's getting into the dermis? The third degree is where you see the scar. And you can see some very aggressive defigurement in, in third degree burning. Okay? Yes, in the very back. Is there, is there something about body rejecting it? Yeah. So if it comes from yourself, you don't have that concern. The body won't reject it. If it comes from another a patient, we, we have cadaver-based grafts, and those would be called allografts. Allo, A-L-L-O, allografts. And so allografts are from the same species, but not the same individual. And in an allograft, you actually just have to make sure that all the cells are out of it before you transplant it to the new patient. And we will do cadaver-based allografts all the time. The other source that we have are what we call xenografts. Z-E-N-O, xeno, graft. 
uh, meaning uh, different species. And we'll get them from bovine or porcine sources. So bovine is cow and porcine is pig. Now again, no cells can be left in it because then the body would reject it if it was cellularized. So the xenografts and the allografts come from either cadavers or at the slaughterhouse, pigs and cows. And uh, they are processed to remove all the cells and then it's just a patch. But this sets up a really interesting um, topic that you all are uh, dancing all around is, well, what other sources are there? Well, this is a company that I used to work for. This was back, a company existed in the 80s and 90s. Um, and this was a tissue engineering company that was trying to make solutions for skin transplants when there weren't any cadaver materials available or if the patient had major burns and you didn't want to harvest it, a large area from the patient in a different location, they may not be able to survive that surgery. That's how, that's how dangerous this could have been. So this company uh, named Advanced Tissue Sciences, it's not around anymore. Um, when I worked, I worked for it towards the end of its era and uh, we ended up selling off all the different parts of the company. Uh, and and the, the, the technology is still out uh, in the medical community, in fact, Dermagraft is the one I'm going to talk about. This one actually is sold by a company known as Organogenesis, and they were, they were actually one of our major competitors, and then they ended up buying out the technology. But the core technology was a scaffold made out of a mesh. You populate it with human cells, fibroblasts from the skin, and they melt, multiply on this matrix, and they make these matrix proteins and these growth factors. And after about two to four weeks in a bioreactor, in a laboratory, under manufacturing conditions, you have a piece of skin. And this is a com completely tissue engineered piece of skin. What it looked like was this. This is a scanning electron micrograph of these fibers, these giant fibers here. This is a fibroblast, a skin fibroblast. You can see that skin fibroblast is stretching out onto those fibers and taking residence. And when they stretch out like that and they grab onto these nearby structures, we know that they're actually in a happy state. And then we know if they start manufacturing growth factors um, and different cytokines that they're, we can measure the level of happiness based upon what kind of growth factors they're cranking out. So the first company that bought it was called Advanced Biogeline, which was owned by Shire. Um, this is an old slide because in the last few months, Organogenesis purchased the company and I didn't get a chance to update the slide. So this technology is still being sold. What's it being used for? Well, so some of these images are a little graphic, and I have a couple of warning slides, but I didn't think this one was all that bad. So this is the bottom of a foot. This is a heel. That is a diabetic foot ulcer. How did that happen? This patient would probably have stepped on a carpet tack. You know those annoying things that are between two rooms, right? And you step on them when you're not wearing shoes, and then you get a, a prick. Um, well, that doesn't heal in the diabetic patient, type 2 diabetic patient, because they have compromised blood flow. And so to enroll in this clinical study, this was in 1995, you can see, see the little date stamps on these. This patient had to be in this state of a chronic non-healing foot ulcer for six months before they would be allowed into the study. Then it was deemed as chronic because it had been sitting open for six months. So. Six months, it hadn't healed, and in 10 weeks, we actually closed it up. Okay, so this is a regenerated tissue, human tissue, being sold today. Many of you that go out into the field may actually put dermograft on your patient's wounds. It really does do quite well. Well, so this was a study that was looking at um, three different time points uh, at three weeks, uh, sorry, at one week, three weeks, and five weeks. And the uh, foot ulcer is shown right here in this patient, and then you can see there's red tracing. And the blue colors inside of the red tracing uh, are synonymous with low blood flow. And the warm colors, like the reds and the yellows and the orange, uh, indicate that after two weeks later, we're increasing blood flow into the wound. And then after five weeks, you can see there's a tremendous amount of new blood vessel development inside the wound, and therefore new blood flow. And that's what's contributing to the healing response is this increase in blood flow. So we can actually measure a product known as VEGF. This is vascular endothelial growth factor. This promotes blood vessel development. 
And we could see in the laboratory on the bench top that when we grew these cells in culture on this matrix, they would increase their production of VEGF over a two-day period. We could also experimentally look at, if we took the cells off, this is a control patch that had no cells on it. So this would be like your skin with no cells in it. This was the Dermgraft product, which was the skin matrix with the fibroblast in it. And you can see all of these red lines, those are all blood vessels. So we knew we had a very robust angiogenic product. It was healing foot ulcers. And of course, from this point, physicians get really excited and they, they, they kind of want to put this technology everywhere they can. Okay, so they're not ready to, uh, uh, to just follow the rules, which is why we love them, because they're pushing the envelope all the time. Um, and so this was a patient who had a very terrible accident. So this was pretty aggressive, just warning you. Uh, this is a patient that actually lost the battle with a chainsaw. And um, this is what happened. Okay? Uh, so we treated this patient. This was at UCLA. <clears throat> we treated this patient immediately. You can kind of see how nicely the, uh, the wounds have been closed and approximated. Okay? So they were sutured in numerous planes, and then there were steri strips on top of that, and then we treated it with the derm graft on top of that for a 10-week period. And this is the patient after a year. So is, is, it a, is it a regeneration after a year in this patient, or do you think it would be more fibrosis? Talk to your neighbor. Regeneration or fibrosis? So, so, the, so the, what's your name? Brandon, up front, is saying that uh, there's still fibrosis, but there is some regeneration that took place, so some blend of the two. And the reason that he says there's still fibrosis is at the level of the mustache, there are areas that the hair hasn't completely grown back. Okay? Um, and so I would agree with that. If you look at across the nose, you can see some scarring. Okay? Um, do you have some elements of regeneration? I would say absolutely. So is it always regeneration, or always fibrosis, or could it be some spectrum sliding scale? It, it could be some spectrum, right? It could be somewhere, if there's a scale of 0 to 10, it could be anywhere along that scale, okay? And, and everybody's an individual, so everyone's going to heal differently, okay? Question? Well, so the, the, the underlying makeup of the, of the skin, of the nose is cartilage, right? The tip of the nose. Uh, but the superficial structures are all epidermis and epidermis. So, you know, instead of a bony architecture, you have a cartilaginous framework. But then you, you know, there is there's a layer on top of that that covers it. So <clears throat> the cartilage itself probably didn't feel very well, okay? But that was actually put back together used with, by a plastic surgeon. And the aesthetic view, that you, you're, you're not looking at cartilage, you're looking at the epithelium. Okay. Any other questions or comments? We were pretty happy about that response. Um, so this is a, a totally different technology from somebody else, not related to anything that I worked on. But um, I want to show it to you because it's pretty darn cool. Skin is the largest organ in the body. And when it's severely burned, it needs to be replaced quickly and massively. The standard techniques that we have now, uh, that takes weeks, months, sometimes. And the reason why people die is because of the infections that develop while we're waiting for the skin to heal. This is a burn. How are you doing, Pamela? Good. Okay. 
Do you see all the fibrosis there? So if we there? can find a way to get normal, healthy skin, as much of it as we want, within a week, that's the only grail on burns for you. George Gerlach thinks he's found a way, but he'll need a gun. We call it a skin cell gun, um, a device for the deposition of skin cells onto the wound. It looked like something you'd see in Star Wars. This is Matt Euro, state police officer from Pennsylvania. He's one of the first people to be treated with the gun. Uh, I attended a uh, July 5th party at a friend's house, and there was a small bonfire. I was standing next to the bonfire, and an individual decided to throw a cup of gasoline on the fire. The worst part was my face. It was the whole right side of my face here, uh, my ear, my neck, and my shoulder, and the entire top part of my arm. Your had suffered severe second degree burns. How do you know it's second degree? Blister. Sure. Sure. Looks like the arm kind of looked like a piece of charred meat, like uh, like a hot dog that was left on a grill too long. The doctor said that I might be a candidate for this new procedure, uh, which is the spray gun, and asked me if I'd be interested. Skin cell spraying is like paint spraying. Just, you need a more sophisticated device to like computer control. We isolate cells from the healthy part of the skin, the patient's own cells, which can be taken in a water solution, and that solution, um, is prepared for cell spraying. Basically what they were, they were doing was taking my stem cells from my skin and putting them all in the gun and spraying it on my arm. Scientists have been able to regenerate sheets of skin for decades. The problem is it takes weeks for that skin to grow and the new skin is extremely fragile. That's that old dermograph. Gerlach's gun solves both of like these problems. It takes like one and a half hour to take the biopsy, to isolate the cells, and to spray the cells. This is what your skin probably looked like before treatment. This is what it looked like four days after it was sprayed with his own Four days. Cells. They did it on a Friday, and my follow-up was that Monday, and the burning unit said it was healed, completely healed. Though the skin gun is still experimental, over a dozen patients have already been successfully treated. Okay. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> <laughs>